you, Yanni, for the introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I work more with uh, beef. I'm beef vegetarian, but I'm also milk vegetarian, I guess. <laughs> so I uh, drink a lot of milk and, and milk products as well. Um, so this is the... Okay. Very good. So um, I will be presenting um, some of the results that we are getting from um, the project on looking at the environmental impact of Kaikuyu-based uh, pasture, dairy pasture systems. Um, to notice also that in addition to the project um, and this project with Dairy App, uh, we also got leverage from um, New South Wales EPA. Um, so through the sustainable partnership with um, the Environmental Protection Authority from New South Wales. And the co-authors that I mentioned in that slide um, are my students, and really they are the ones that have done most of the work. I just stole in a couple of slides from them, and I will pretend that I know what I'm talking about. But they have done most of the work. So while we are doing this work, and I think today, this, this morning, we had excellent presentations from Richard um, and also from, from Aaron, so I think I probably I don't need to say too much about this, but um, um, Richard mentioned about the commitments and pressure on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we really need to, to work on that. And the main reason is um, our dose in relation to um, you know, meeting the Paris Agreement, um, but also um, trying to work collaboratively with the industry to achieve the commitments and also responding to consumer pressures and to also private companies. So in this space, um, as Richard and Aaron said today, um, we know a lot of stuff about greenhouse gases, uh, but there are still some things that, that we don't know. Uh, and one of them is the path to carbon neutrality. And, and I think both of them were pretty clear on that, um, that it's going to be a difficult task. Um, and um, we, we need to put the, the maximum effort to try to get there. So what we are trying to do in this project is try to understand some of the, or fill some of the gaps that we have on trying to understand, for example, carbon cycles and what things on commercial farms are affecting greenhouse gas emissions as total and emission intensities as well. So the two um, graphs that you can see there, the one on the top are the um, average um, emissions in terms of as, as a proportion of total um, dairy farm emissions. As we can see there, um, most of the emissions are coming from uh, methane, from um, enteric fermentation. And um, the figure in the bottom is showing how productivity affects um, the intensity of um, greenhouse gas emissions per liter of milk produced. And those are things that, that we are working on. In the first one, uh, when you look up there, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, sources um, that are considered there for, for emissions. We want to understand really a little bit deeper the carbon cycle. And Richard talked today um, about that, and probably I will um, expand a little bit on that and the views and some of the results we are getting in terms of um, carbon sinks um, particularly. So we'll move on into um, some of the um, work that we are doing. Um, so we are looking at the um, entire uh, production system, and uh, we can divide the project into um, several parts. We started doing a little review um, we are looking also at soil organic carbon in commercial dairy farms, uh, both intensive and extensive dairy farms, um, and then looking at the uh, fluxes or fluxes of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from pastures. Um, so I will be showing um, some of the data um, that, um, that uh, Milad um, has been collecting on carbon fluxes from pastures, and some of the modeling that Melissa is doing on, on greenhouse um, balance. Um, and looking at nutrition, for example, how productivity affects um, that intensity of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, it's all uh, preliminary data that I pres I'm presenting today. Um, so we'll have more data as we progress um, through the project. I will jump on um, this slide because I think it was covered very well by uh, both presenters um, this morning. And um, I will... Um, talk a little bit about what we are doing. So we are working on the Australian Dairy Carbon Calculator and the DGAF, uh, both of the models that Aaron uh, mentioned this morning and Richard as well. And we are trying to, to put the data from commercial farms to understand uh, what are the main factors that are driving emissions 
and how we can um, change eventually some part of the production system to reduce either the intensity or the total um, emissions on a farm. Um, and the idea is that we'll uh, fill some of the gaps um, that are currently in the calculators. Uh, for example, one of them is on soil organic carbon, and um, there was a lot of talk about this morning, soil organic carbon, and it's a very hot topic today because the first um, carbon credit units uh, were issued um, to different projects this year. Um, and, um, you know, you know, you heard about the, the, the concerns about um, those methodologies and soil carbon um, increasing with rainfall and um, decreasing when we have a dry year. Um, so I'll move on uh, more into the, the, res the results that, that we are seeing. Um, in the first study that, that Melissa completed, um, he looked at um, the effect of concentrate feeding level on um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what you can see there on the slide at the, on the left, um, you can see total me uh, dry matter intake and uh, fat um, and protein corrected milk yield um, in liters per cow and kilograms per day. So as you can see, when we increase um, uh, the concentrate level from one to more than three tons of um, concentrate per cow per year, uh, both of them dry matter intake increases and fat and protein corrected milk increase. So that increase in diet quality is making the animals more productive. And as we expect, uh, when you are increasing productivity, then you are um, reducing the intensity of um, greenhouse gas emissions in terms of um, carbon dioxide equivalent per liter or per kilogram of fat and protein corrected milk. Um, in this case, what we've seen, and we considered also um, the uh, footprint of the carbon emissions for those um, concentrates that are purchased or farm, or farm and the uh, environmental cost of moving those concentrates, um, bringing those into the farm. So what we've seen particularly a big difference in the intensity of greenhouse gas emissions from very low um, or from low concentrate um, level of less than one ton to uh, more than one ton um, of concentrate per cow per, um, per cow per year. And I also added in there, um, so if you want um, to put a number into your farm and you know how many liters um, or how many kilograms of fat and co protein corrected milk you produce in a year, then you multiply um, that by the number that you get there, 0.90, 0.78, 79, or 0 um, 0.77, and you'll get the total kilograms or ton of carbon dioxide equivalent that you could uh, be um, avoiding or reducing to release to the, to the atmosphere by um, increasing concentrate um, supplementation, which is uh, mainly as a result of increasing productivity. The other thing that I added into that slide on the right-hand side is the, the blue bars on um, the um, stocking rate, um, and um, as expected, as you increase, um, as you increase the concentrate feeding level, uh, you're having a higher, um, a, a, a lower um, stocking rate in terms of um, cows um, per hectare. Now, um, why did I show that? Because I want to um, put out a little bit of the results that we've got with the chambers and measuring fluxes of greenhouse gases from uh, pastures, from um, dairy pastures, and also from some um, beef pastures. We have these environmental chambers um, that you can see in that picture. Um, so those chambers, um, they open and close approximately every one and a half hours in the field. And we measure the concentration of gas every second um, during the period that they are closed. So when we see a change, for example, a reduction in um, CO2 concentration is because that CO2 is being used by the ecosystem, for example, by the plants to do photosynthesis. Um, if um, that happens with methane, that is a reduction in methane concentration, is eventually because the uh, methanotrophic bacteria, so those bacteria in the soil uh, that use CH4 as an energy source, um, are using that methane. So um, those chambers allow us to see, uh, have a very good picture on greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas balance from the entire ecosystem. So it's not only the plant, but it's also the soil and the bacteria in the soil, which are related to things that um, Richard was talking today. And we also mentioned nitrous oxide um, as well. 
So we've been doing this um, for um, a couple of years now, and the data that I put there are the fluxes in grams of CO2 per hectare per day for um, carbon dioxide on the left-hand side, um, CH4 in the middle, um, so methane in the middle, and nitrous oxide on the right-hand side. And those are frequency um, histograms, so it's telling you uh, what the majority of the values that we obtained, where they are sitting. So if you have a look, for example, at the graph on the left, which is CO2, you'll see that uh, towards the right-hand side of the x-axis, you have the zero value there. So towards the left, um, it's negative, so it means that the pasture is taking up or is consuming that CO2 from the atmosphere. And on the right-hand side of that zero, is because the pasture or the um, ecosystem is releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. Yeah. And that is a lot of data. There are several thousand data points in there. Uh, the main thing is that the pasture, they can act as both as a source and a sink of carbon dioxide and the same for methane. Now, what we are trying to do is to try to understand what are, are the, all those factors that are um, increasing, for example, the uptake or the use of carbon dioxide or the um, you know, disappearance of or oxidation of methane, for example, and what are the factors that are contributing to um, the release of, of, of those gases. Now, that's a lot of information in the uh, methane. We see a similar thing that the pasture, they can act as you know, um, a, a, a methane um, um, oxidation um, sink or also as a methane uh, releasing ecosystem, so releasing methane, and a similar thing for nitrous oxide. Now you say, well, what does all that data mean? And we are still chewing up on the data, trying to understand and studying all the factors that may be contributing to pastures being either taking up um, those gases or producing or releasing those gases, so we can start advising on grazing management, for example, um, to improve uptake of those gases. Now, um, in the next slide, I say, well, let's do something. Um, we've been talking about, um, this morning, Richard was talking about, um, you know, total carbon dioxide equivalents um, and the global warming potential of the different gases. So what I've done in this slide, I put all the gases together, and I say, well, if carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of one in 100 years, yeah, then methane has a global warming potential of 28 times carbon dioxide, yeah, and nitrous oxide about 265 times uh, the global warming potential of one kilogram of carbon, carbon dioxide. And I added all of those together for the pasture. And basically, um, what we've seen is a similar thing. Um, the pastures, they are acting as either, um, a sink or a source. Uh, but when we average all data across all the data that we collected, uh, we get that the pastures on average are um, taking up about eight kilograms of CO2 equivalent per day. And this is about two years time with um, you know, a lot of data that we have collected. And I say how that translates into a farming system. And then if we go back to the data that I presented um, in terms of a stocking rate, we see stocking rate is anywhere between one and two cows uh, per hectare um, in, in most of the uh, production systems that, that we looked at. And a cow is producing about 400 grams of methane uh, per day. When you multiply that 400 grams of methane per day times 28, you get a cow is producing about 11 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per cow and per day, and our pasture system is um, apparently capturing or uptaking um, eight kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So it's about 80% um, of what the cow is emitting. It's being taken up by the pasture. And I repeat that in these pasture systems, we have a lot of measurements in a lot of different systems, even after mulching, um, dry periods, uh, wet periods. So what Richard was saying today um, in terms of, yes, the, the, the animal is a, an intermediate in that carbon cycle. The animal, um, the, the plant is taking the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then the animal comes and eats the plant, and then part of that um, carbon goes to milk and to the body of the animal, and the rest goes back to the atmosphere. Yeah. So I think it's um, what I'm um, coming to the conclusion about this is, yes, we still need to study a lot, uh, but in our view, 
um, or in my view, um, there is potential there to start thinking about the role that the animal is playing in that um, grazing system and what is the real uh, global warming potential of the dairy industry. Do we need to start considering some of these fluxes of carbon as well to make the numbers? Because if the cow is really eating, um, and this is, by the way, considering the 28 times global warming potential of methane, that it's going to be a much longer time in the atmosphere, and it's also um, will warm um, the radiative forces higher as well. So we are considering all of that. So um, whether we need to consider that and start um, putting a number into so some of those thing, uh, things, I think we are too early to say something like that, um, but this is um, what we are heading. Now, the other topic that came up today as well is soil organic carbon, um, and we are doing uh, work with commercial uh, dairy farms where we um, are doing, um, you know, carbon um, auditing or measurements of soil organic carbon, and Madi is doing a lot of this work, so these beautiful graphs um, are from, from Madi. Um, I'm not that good at, at putting colors, um, but she um, divided this in carbon estimation areas, um, so it means an area is, for example, an irrigated type of pasture or a dry land native pasture or a crop or a particular rotation. And we are looking at the um, soil organic carbon. So those are the points that we are sampling in commercial dairy farms, uh, both intensive and intensive, and we want to understand this a bit better. So when we put that information together with soil maps, this is what you can see in there. Um, in, in one of the properties, and this is in Costofin, so the, the dairy farm that we have across the road, uh, basically we have levels of soil organic carbon there, and this is um, showing the uh, percentage of uh, soil organic carbon between 15 and 30 centimeters um, depth. And as you can see, um, there are lighter areas, which I cannot, uh, oh yeah, I can point, look at this, that's nice. Um, so you can see some of these lighter areas um, that they do have um, lower soil organic carbon, and those are native pastures. When you look at some of the areas that they do have uh, darker uh, colors or higher soil organic carbon, um, they are uh, kaikuyu and ray grass pastures. So one of the things that you guys do as, as producers um, on a dairy farm is to make the system very productive. Um, and um, Martin um, was showing some of that data today that a Kikuyo pasture can be producing 14, producing 14 tons of uh, biomass uh, per hectare per year. So those are very big numbers, and I think we need to start looking at how that productivity of the system, of the pasture, of the cow, and so on and so forth, is really affecting that carbon balance in dairy um, farms. So um, this was a little bit of um, an update of the work that is ongoing. Um, there is a lot of work um, that we are doing. Um, certainly for me, um, you know, I think it's, it's very exciting stuff to be looking at things that we didn't pay much attention before, like pasture greenhouse gas um, fluxes. I think it's an area that we talk about, but nobody has really measured. Um, it's not easy to measure. We were lucky that Milad, one of the um, PhD students, um, it's very good at electronics and put these automated chambers together and we are able to collect these data as we were never able to do before. Um, we can apply treatments today and we can like, do a, a lot of different things. And, and the question that I have is, if we start comparing it, you know, a, a, a producer that is doing an excellent pasture management compared to you know, less excellent uh, pasture management, is that really making a difference in terms of greenhouse gas um, emissions, and also on the productivity of the cows, and is there a multiplicative effect that we have to start recognizing because eventually we'll increase soil organic carbon, we'll increase um, carbon uptake from the atmosphere, and we'll also increase the productivity of the cows. So we are trying to start to understand a little bit of those um, things that are interplaying or playing together to really understand these um, carbon cycles in, in dairy firm systems and see how management practices are affecting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think um, soil organic carbon, it's a lot of work to do and, and we are um, sampling um, hopefully a lot of these properties before the end of the year. Um, and, and we'll get eventually uh, for the next um, symposium, we'll get some more um, information hopefully uh, in terms of cattle nutrition and productivity, um, 
And it's well known that increasing productivity will reduce the intensity of methane emissions, um, whether that um, you know, becomes in the future a method um, recognized in some way uh, or shape or form um, to you know, either have a product that is um, low emissions intensity or carbon crediting or whatever shape um, that is, um, I think it's, it's probably going to, to be part of all the discussions that are going to continue happening in this space. Um, and then the other part that is, um, that is ongoing is all this research on carbon balance um, on um, more intensive or extensive or pasture-based um, dairy systems. And we want to really understand uh, what are the differences. Both of them, they do have advantages and disadvantages from an environmental point of view. And we really want to understand um, what is, um, you know, what are the, um, the comparisons, for example, productivity and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also the, all the input of typical production systems um, that are available or that are being used in Australia. And with that, I conclude my presentation for today. Thank you, everybody. Open for any questions. Thanks very much, Luciano. Any questions for Luciano? Yes, there is one over there, please. I can hear, I think. <laughs> I can speak loudly. Uh, on the, on the, there we go. Um, on the flux of greenhouse gases um, with the pasture, were the cows that were measured in that, were they eating any concentrate or were they just eating the coquia? So the question is if the cows are eating concentrate that were in those pastures, uh, they are eating concentrate. Uh, but one of the big differences of the work we are doing is we are using those chambers so really the cow, the emissions that are in the air from the cow are not really accounted for because we look at when we close the chamber, how the concentration decreases or increases. Yeah, so really the emissions from the cows are kept outside. And I think like any technique has advantages and disadvantages. This technique has the advantage that you isolate, isolate the measurements from that chamber from anything that is around. Yeah. So it's independent from what the cow is doing, but yes, the cows were feed, uh, being fed concentrates are in there in the same pasture, yes. So with that, then, is the sequestration of the carbon that's happening to the crop that grew the concentrate being factored in? When you said the pasture's taking up 80% of that, that carbon that's being emitted, but obviously not the whole diet is the pasture either. So are we taking yes. into account the carbon that's being sequestered by the grain they're eating, mm -hmm. or the, the wheat yes, through the grain? Yes, so that, that's a good question. So the, the two data sets that I presented, um, one on the level of concentrate and the other one on the fluxes, they are two independent work. We didn't put them together. The idea is to bring them together. In the work that we've done with the modeling and the concentrate level, we, yes, we did include the carbon footprint of the concentrate that is being used all the concentrates, uh, concentrate is purchased outside and we consider that into the equation, yes. Any other question? I think this, Luciano, this is really adding to the, oh, sorry, this is one there. Flux, so just thinking through that, um, Essentially, if there is, uh, a, you know, an, a constant uptake of carbon into the soil, uh, that kind of, and that's ongoing, that implies that that soil carbon will continue to sequester carbon forever, but we know that isn't the case. So the system will end up in a flux. So even though you've observed that, I do wonder if you took more long-term measurements through a flux tower or something, you would see those losses eventually come out under whatever circumstances, and you could basically say that the system was in, you know, was in equilibrium. We've got the, the losses and the, um, the gains of carbon there over a longer term. Um, but it's very interesting about that methane component and just the, uh, the yeah, the uh, 
Nathana Trofs. And yeah, that. thank you. Um, no, I think it's a very valid point, and it's something that we thought about that. Um, the system cannot be, well, I, we don't know it. We need to understand it better. Um, the, 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 the preliminary observation is correct. The system cannot be capturing carbon forever. Now, it is the system capturing carbon, really, or is that carbon the part of the carbon that is going back to the atmosphere and part of the carbon that is going out with the milk and the meat? And it and it's part going to the soil, and what proportion is going to each place. So it's very, that's why I think that when we talk about the carbon cycle, yeah, we've done a lot of research over the years, but we still have a lot to know. And there are things that we didn't put a, no a real number into it. Um, we are still surprised about a lot of the results we get and how sensible, you know, the system is to these fluxes in terms of you mulch. You know, when you mulch, for example, you have all the forage that stays on top of the, if the cow doesn't eat it, it stays on the ground and produces CO2 again. Now, if the cow eats it, it's that, it goes away. The mulching also not only will end up oxidizing that biomass that is on the surface of the pasture, but also the root system. The root system will shorten when you graze it, and then all that root is going to be producing a lot of CO2, and that's why we see all of those positive emissions. So what is the proportion of everything? I think it's, it, it's something that we don't really know today. So to be honest, I, I, I cannot, I, can, I agree with your point, but I don't think we have real data to have you know, a real understanding of all of that. Did you run the chambers at night? All day, all day. And what you see is of obviously during the day it's negative, during the night they are producing. So the chambers open every one hour. They open and close for 10 minutes, and then it's when we measure that. So I think we are doing really good measurements um, to really have a good understanding of, of the topic. Um, now, again, the data that, we, that I presented today, it is preliminary data. We need to look at, because you say, well, what proportion of the farm is your chamber representative of? Because if you have a crop on the other paddock and we didn't measure the crop, so yes, it is complex, but what, I, what we've done is we dumped all the data that we had together with days that are producing a lot of, releasing a lot of CO2 and days that are capturing a lot of CO2. Some of these Calcuyo pastures we observed uh, 400 kilograms of CO2 equivalent being uptaken in a day. 400 kilograms in a day. And 250 release in a day as well. So, yeah, it, it opens up for a lot of discussion, but I think that's the exciting part of, of that work that will let us understand much better a lot of these. That's what we are interested, that carbon cycle, that real carbon cycle, where is that carbon going? You know, part may be in the soil, part may be in the animal, in the milk, in the meat, go back to the atmosphere, wildlife, insects, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I think the important thing is that we are measuring, so it's, uh, we are hopefully trying to clarify that and when the process is complete, the, we will be able to say how important or not mm -hmm. all that is. So well done, Luciano, thanks very Thank much. Thank you.